Happy New Year, everybody. And is this officially draft season? No, nah, not yet. The NFL season's still going on, so not quite draft season. You still have the college football playoffs. Once we get past the national title game next week between Washington and Michigan, then it'll be the official start of draft season. But we continue to process and keep you up to date on what's going on. Tony, how was your New Year, my friend? I, okay, first of all, it's always draft season for me, so there, there, there's never really a break in draft season. But uh, and, that, it was and by my... the way, Tony, that that that's why you're on the show because it is always draft season. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, my new year was good. I hope uh, everyone else's new year out there went well and was safe. Uh, I'm a little bit under the weather, so if you hear me cough or I gotta wipe my nose or something, let me apologize in advance. Well, but, Tony, uh, I get it. You know. You spend 14 hours at Times Square like you do every year. Oh, it gets yeah. I the, used I to do that. You know, I, I, I did that like in the 80s from like 1980 to 1990. We, I went to Times Square every year. No, you then, didn't. Yes, yes, yes. And then <laughs> they started to uh, hurt everybody into pens like cattle. I said, oh, the heck with this. But back in the 80s, it was a lot of fun. It was was it really? Because it looks yeah. miserable. I got to be honest yeah. with you. I could not have less interest in doing it. Yep. When Back in the 80s, you used to be able to, say, get off at 56th Street and walk all the way up to the Times Square building unabated. It was not a problem. And then what happened was, I'm going to say late 80s, early 90s, they started where they would just pen the people in into different areas. And I agree with you. I mean, now you got to get there at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon and stand around for uh, 10 hours or so to watch the ball drop for 60 seconds. So when you're, when you're young and you're in college, it's a fun thing to do. But I would agree with you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even get close to that place now. I'm sure there are other interesting things happening during that celebration during the 80s, too, that we won't talk about on draft season. I'm sure it was a wild time, needless to say. Uh, it, it was a wild time in the college football playoffs yesterday and, of course, it, with bowl season this weekend. And we'll get to the college football playoffs in a second, Tony. But as an old school guy who, who's obviously followed college football closely over the course of 20 years following the draft, I, I know this bowl season is kind of like a bummer now because there are yeah. so many really good players that just aren't playing in these games. You know, you look at the Ohio State-Missouri game. I mean, Ohio State had no offense in that game because everybody opted out. And they you, look at what hap- you look at what happened with Florida State and Georgia. I mean, Florida State was on their third-string quarterback. And I think it really it really hit home yesterday on January 1st where there were two games on, Tennessee-Iowa and Oregon Liberty. And I'm watching Tennessee-Iowa and Joe Milton, the quarterback from Tennessee who started his career at Michigan, who is a very talented player who started, I believe, 12 games in his college career. He's got great amount of upside, which he's never met, decided to opt out of the game against Iowa to prepare for the draft. And I don't know what Joe Milton gains by opting out of that game against Iowa. Then if you turned over and watched Oregon against Liberty, you're seeing Bo Nix play. You're seeing Bucky Irving play. You're seeing, you know, the majority, I, I think they had two guys who opted out. They had the receiver, Troy Franklin, and the center. But I'm watching Bo Nix play in the bowl game, the Fiesta Bowl, and I'm watching Joe Milton, who opted out, and I, I'd say there's something wrong with this pitcher. Bo Nix is, I have him as a second-round pick. Some people think he can go in the first round. I mean, Joe Milton, he's a day-three pick. Maybe he's a third-round pick if he has a great senior bowl week. But right now, he's basically a fifth, sixth round pick. I, I don't understand the thinking with some of these guys who opted out. <clears throat> and you can see, I mean, most of those bowl games, the New Year's Day bowl games, which are usually filled to the brim, those stadiums were half full. And I, I think it's, it's ha- really having a very negative effect uh, on a, 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 in a variety of ways. Yeah, and look, and I think that's the most exciting thing about the college football playoffs next year, expanding the way it is, Tony. Selfishly for us who, who are doing this for, for draft evaluation reasons, right? Fewer opt-outs. You know, if these teams are in the college football playoffs and they're going to have a lot of prospects because they're good teams, right? More guys are going to play in these games, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. You think? But, I mean, if you're the eighth-ranked team and the eighth-ranked team has a quarterback or cornerback, that's going to be a top 20 pick. It's going to be an interesting thing to see whether that, you know, whether we have opt outs from those lower rated teams in the playoffs. I don't think it's a guarantee that all these guys you think are going so? to play. A chance we'll see what to happens. Play like the one seed and, and upset them in round one. I can't imagine players would opt out of that, would they? You, it, it'll be bad optics. But again, why did Joe Milton opt out of the Iowa game yesterday? I mean, what it was a good defense. It turned out that Tennessee destroyed him anyway. So you never know with, with some of these decisions. What happens is people get into these players' ears. 
family members, the agents, whoever. No reason to play. It could be the kid himself. Um, no reason to play in the ball game. It's going to be an interesting dynamic if it happens. Yeah, it'll yeah. be something worth keeping an eye on. Absolutely. It's funny. I was talking to Dory Jackson in the locker room over here last week, and we were talking about, you know, USC, and, and this is a USC guy, Caleb Williams, opting out. And he goes, look, I get it, but I don't. And he's like, I played in a bowl game. And if you remember, Tony, he hurt himself in the bowl game. And he goes, I don't care. I wouldn't have changed anything. You know, I wanted to play in the game. You're playing for your teammates. You're trying to be a competitor. I wanted to play in the game, and I got hurt, and I I, I still wouldn't go back and change that. So it's funny to get different players' perspectives on these sorts of things. You know, and, and there have been some ma major injuries. Remember the Jalen Smith, yep. the linebacker mm -hmm. from Notre Dame, which was a devastating injury. Remember Jake Butt, the tight end, going down with a knee injury in his bowl game, you know, his senior season. Unfortunately, it does happen. It could happen in the bowl game. It could happen the first game of the season. Um, but I, I, I think just like everything else in college football, it's gone too far to one side of the spectrum with these opt-outs out, opt at this point. All right, guys, very busy show today. So we're going to talk about all the bowl <laughs> games, obviously. We have some senior bowl announcements. We have a draft announcement. And then if we have time at the end, maybe I'll do a, a couple of Twitter questions. We're also going to do an update on the draft order and how that might be impacted by the games this weekend. But Tony, let's start with the bowl games. And I suppose we need to start with the college football playoffs, two games that literally went down to the last play. I mean, you cannot get more dramatic games. I'm on very little sleep because I stayed up for that, <laughs> uh, for that Washington game. I am exhausted, but it was worth it. It looked like Washington had the game in hand, a silly penalty on, on the, on the punt at the end. Uh, they had an unfortunate injury to their running back that stopped the clock when they're running the clock out. It gave Texas a chance to get the ball down. They had three chances at the end zone, and they just couldn't punch it in. And Washington held on for the win. From a game point of view, I mean, I thought Washington kept the Texas Longhorns in that game from the get-go because that game really, it looked like it could have been a blowout for Washington. And you had the fumble on the punt return, too, right from, early. From the get-go. I, I mean, to me, it looked like Washington was playing as though it was a do-or-die game. Texas looked like they were playing the first game of the season. They just looked unprepared. They, they didn't seem to be a sense of urgency. I think with, with Washington, you obviously you got to start off with Michael Penix. Now, he was tremendous. He was tremendous. And they talked about a story in the game yesterday about how the day before the game, Michael Penix asked all the coaches to leave the locker room, and he had a players-only meeting, which he held for 20 minutes, and everybody was everybody was like, stun sons, and that's what you want from your quarterback. That's what you want from your leader. And then we saw the best of Michael Penix. I talked about him being streaky being inconsistent. You didn't see that yesterday. No. Really right from the get-go. The deep passes were beautiful. The intermediate passes were on the mark. He played smart, mistake-free football. When he had to take off and run up, uh, up the field and run, he was able to do it productively. He ran that offense flawlessly. I, I think, you know, you do not want to really give a guy, uh, grade a guy off of one performance, especially the Texas uh, Texas game where their secondary is very suspect. Tell that Penix, to C.J. Stroud, Tony. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> but the thing about C.J. Stroud was I kind of knew that. We kind of knew that about C.J. Stroud. It was more a coaching thing. And, and uh, it was I, also against Georgia, by the way, which is a big deal. Right. Um, but the thing with Penix, he was phenomenal. I, I mean, all credit to him. He, he, he's liked by his teammates. I, I hope, he, you know, hopefully we'll see him at the senior bowl. Uh, there's a lot to be played. I, I still don't think he's a first round pick, but, you know, he was very impressive yesterday. The leadership, the pa passing, the decision making deserves a tremendous amount of credit. Yeah. And look, you saw the bevy of Washington receivers as his targets, right? He spread the ball around their tight yes. end, had a handful of catches. Jalen McMillan had five catches for 58 yards and a touchdown. Jalen Polk continues to erupt this year. Five catches, 122 yards and a touchdown. And Roma Dunzier was Roma Dunzier. Just another day of the office, six catches, 125 yards. All three of those players are going to be drafted, Tony. I wouldn't be shocked if all three of those players are, are gone by the end of day two, the way Polk has played at the end of this year. So, uh, just really good players, and they all kind of have a little bit of a different skill set. Use the tight ends very well, Westover and Culp. They were involved in the action. And, and you're right. I mean, early on, it was a doom, it was in Duse and Polk. McMillan wasn't involved. Second half, McMillan got involved. And, you know, again, it was Penix running the show, distributing the ball to all his receivers, using all his targets. And 
before the injury, you know, the running back had played very well. He even played very well during the injury. He was, he was out on the field. And I like the way, even though he had an injured foot, what the coaches would do, if you watch a couple of plays, they would send them out on the flanks as a wide out to basically draw a man out on a cover a guy that was injured and they'd run the ball on the inside. So it, was a, it was a terrific overall game from, um, from Washington. I, I think the, uh, the other guy who really, uh, first of all, their offensive tackles, I thought had a terrific uh, game. Fanadu, who is the left tackle, who some people project as the first guard taken off the board. Rosengarden, who, if you read my piece at uh, Sports Skeeter yesterday, I'm told he is going to enter the draft once Washington season's over. He's a guy who I project as a second round pick. Others say third, but if you watch him, he's got power. He's got mobility. He can get out on the second level. I thought their offensive tackles played very well. And then Braylon Trice. I mean, he was a disruptor was yesterday. Great. He was incredible all over the place, rushing on the edge. They stunted him in the middle. He was able to penetrate the line of scrimmage. I thought the Texas offensive line, especially Christian Jones, the right tackle, had a really difficult uh, day yesterday. Uh, and it was a, it was an excellent team effort from Washington. Their stars stood out and really did what they had to do. But they got contributions from everybody. Two guys I want to focus on here, Tony. And you just mentioned Braylon Trice, so I'll go there first. I know a lot of people say he's not going to test well. I don't know what you're hearing on that front. But he is so gosh darn productive. It's going to be hard to keep that dude out of the end of the first round. It just is. It depends on what your definition of not testing well is. I'm told he's going to run a low four sevens at over 270 pounds. That's pretty good. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, maybe he only he only vertical jumps 29 inches. They're not doing vertical jumps on Sunday. But, you know, it, it obviously is a measure. Guy can play football. Uh, and like I said, they showed him, they highlight, uh, displayed him in a variety of roles yesterday as an edge rusher up the middle. Excellent movement skills, can play off the line of scrimmage and came up big for him. Yeah, and he's powerful too. He's strong. Um, <laughs> and then Roma Dunzie. It's just funny. You watch him. And again, like, I think the conversation, him versus Malik Neighbors for wide receiver two, is going to be one that's going to be fun throughout the year because they're so different with, you know, with the way they play. And when you watch a Dunzie, Everything is just so smooth. You know, contested catches. He's just unbothered by the defenders near him. He's able to adjust to the ball in the air. He makes everything look so smooth and easy, and he makes difficult catches look like just a day at the park for him. And, you know, he's a guy that has, I think, can really do a little bit of everything. I don't think there's a hole in his game, Tony. I wonder about, you know, the explosiveness and, and things like that. But, I mean, my good goodness, the, the numbers and just the, the breadth of the things he can do. And, again, the way he makes catches down the field and traffic look easy, uh, somebody's going to get a really good wide, wide wide receiver when they pick him in the draft. I would say probably in the top 15 picks next year, uh, this year. Well, that 65-yard, that 66-yard bomb where it was the over-the-shoulder catch with the defender draped on his back was a thing of beauty. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing about, you know, the testing. And I've said all along the thing about Adunzi is, you know, he's going to have trouble separating at the next level, or he looks like he's going to have trouble separating at the next level. You got to remember in the lead up to the combine, a lot of these guys never had any track training. They really don't know how to run. They know how to play football, and how to run football, but they don't know how to run for the stopwatch. So what's going to happen is after, uh, a a after Washington season is over next week, the dudes is going to have to decide whether or not he's playing in the senior ball. He'll start training for the combine. They'll then teach him running techniques, which you know, he's projected to be a four or five, one guy who knows, maybe all of a sudden now he's a low four, four guy, but yeah, he's a guy again, like Michael Penix just continually answers the bell, continually comes up in the big spot. And, and, and you know, there's no let up in this guy. Uh, and, and I would agree with you. I still have Malik neighbors as my number two wide out for a variety of reasons, primarily because LSU receivers have been great in the NFL and neighbors is a guy who continually gets better. <laughs> I don't know that Adunzi gets better, but he just continually performs at a very high level. All right, let's let let's jump over to Texas here, Tony. Let's start with their offense. Uh, you know, Quinn Ewers, rough first half. He finished 24-38 for 318 yards and a touchdown. Came on later in the game. Your guy, Jatavian Sanders, had a nice game. Six catches, 75 yards. Whittington, a wide receiver we talked about last week. I think we got a question about him uh, via Twitter, if I recall. He had four catches set for 70 yards. And then the two wide receivers that people think could be, you know, late first rounders, early second rounders, Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell, just two for 45 for Worthy. He could have had another deep one, but he lost the ball in the lights, couldn't see it. And then Mitchell was four for 32 in this game, and he had a couple catches late. Otherwise, he was very quiet. 
you know, the thing about those stats, especially with Sanders, is a lot of it was garbage stats in the sense that going into the fourth uh, quarter, I think Mitchell had one catch. I don't know if Worthy had a catch. I think Sanders had two or three catches. So they really were a non-factor. It was when Texas basically threw everything against the wall, those stats started to, to improve. I agree. It was not a good game by Quinn Ewers. I think it, he had problems because the offensive line couldn't seem to get anything going. They couldn't get the running game going. Go back to Christian Jones, the right tackle. Some people project him as a fourth-round choice. He looked like an undrafted free agent most of the night last night. But the uh, the left tackle, who's a sophomore, had had his struggles. The center, Jake Majors, who I like a lot, I thought he played re- reasonably well. It just seemed to me that, you know, they didn't. They really weren't prepared. As I said at, at the beginning, it se- Washington played like it was a do-or-die game. Texas, it looked like it was the first game of the season they, were, they came out. There was no continuity. There was there was no tempo. They seemed to get it uh, to get it early, but uh, in the uh, second quarter, but they couldn't keep it going. And a lot of that, you know, had to do with watching. They they go for it on the fourth down uh, early. They don't make it. They give Texas the ball back. It, it was, there was just no tempo. There's no rhythm uh, on that uh, the Texas offense. Ewers was okay. He was getting beat up. There were a lot of there were a lot of turnovers. He had some drop passes. Uh, you know, it, it, Texas was just off last night. Washington he, played gr- great, but Texas was off. You're still here, and yours is yours is going to go back to school, right? <laughs> that's what. I, <clears throat> excuse me. That's what I heard as of last week. Yeah, he's going to go back to school. <clears throat> you know, the uh, everybody talks about Arch Manning. I, I was told that Manning's family is ha- is okay with him sitting on the side uh, on the sidelines for another year. Some people are not all that. High on Arch Manning, it's more name and, uh, you know, name recognition than anything else. But I had heard as of last week, you were going to go back to school. And then just finally, I don't want to go back to Penix again. But again, we talk about the negatives with the transfer portal sometimes, Tony. This is the positive, right? The kid finally gets healthy, goes to Washington. I mean, if you would have came out after his final year in Indiana, he's what, like a sixth round pick, something like that. If, If that with all his injury issues. And he is just taking advantage of this opportunity. Good for him. And the thing is this, go back to what I said last week. You know, with these quarterbacks, whether it's Bo Nix, whether it's Michael Penix, whether it's Jaden Daniels, this is his second year in that Washington program, in that Washington season. You go to the quarterbacks that transferred, only played one year, Sam Hartman at Notre Dame. We all thought that Sam Hartman, we saw what he did at Wake Forest. We thought, wow, now he's going to Notre Dame. They're going to contend for the college football players. Never happened. I mean, Sam Hartman's game, I think, this year took a step back than it, than where he was uh, as a senior at Wake Forest. So I think there's something to be said for those quarterbacks who are in those pro- – transfer and are in those programs for two years. Yeah, we'll see what Riley Leonard does at in, in Notre Dame now coming up next year and how long he stays there. Um, all right, let, let's go to the other game, Tony. Again, a game that went to overtime. Michigan defeats Alabama 27-20. Well, we just talked about the quarterbacks. Let's start there with J.J. McCarthy. A typical J.J. McCarthy type of game, right? 17-27, 221 yards, three touchdowns. He leads that game-tying touchdown drive. Uh, had two throws on the drive that were significant. One was really just a jump off, a dump off to Blake Corum that he ran uh, for a big game. Part of it got called back because of a, a holding penalty, if I recall. And then he had that deep over route. But that gets partially tipped at the line of scrimmage. Yeah. So we don't even we don't even know what that throw looks like if it doesn't get tipped. Is it does it is it accurate? Does it hit the receiver? I don't know the answer to that question. But Mook McCarthy was good. He was solid. He 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 showed off his arm. He showed off his mobility. Uh, he would, had some early a couple of throws that maybe weren't as accurate as you want. But for the most part, I think he was accurate. Your thought on what McCarthy showed against Alabama? I, if you compare JJ McCarthy to Jalen Milrow, and I was thinking about this watching the game. Jalen McCarthy is a big time playmaker. Jalen Milrow makes big time plays with his arm. And I don't know that JJ McCarthy can do that. Uh, but the fact is this he leads that offense. He's in command of the situation. You know, he, he, he knows how to run the offense. He's a cocky, confident guy. I agree with you. That's always been my concern with JJ McCarthy is that he doesn't have that great next level arm. He's not a guy like, Penix or Milrow, who can, you know, uh, slide, uh, drive the ball 60 yards down or 40 yards downfield, can drive the outs, you know, through the, through the tight spots. Buddy does a great job running the offense. And I think he's going to end up 
as the you know fourth quarterback off the board, probably a first uh, a first round pick because of the need of quarterbacks. I think he's one of those guys that, <clears throat> in a realistic world, you're going to give him a second round grade. But because he's a quarterback, he's going to end up as a first round pick. And I am told I was even told last night he's going to enter the draft. Okay, good to know. Running game, obviously a big part of what they do. Uh, Blake Corum, 19 rushes, 83 yards, a touchdown. We saw his kind of shiftiness, change of direction with a couple jump cuts during the game. Just doesn't have that top speed. You know who he kind of reminds me of, Tony? Who, who's had a really good year in the NFL this year, and maybe it will help Blake Corum? He reminds me of Kyron Williams a little bit. Yeah, I would agree. And as I said about Blake Corum, he's not a great athlete. You know, he he's... He, he's like the brown kid from Illinois a year ago, if you will. Yeah, That's Chase Brown. Really, yeah, he, he reminds me that he's just a really good football player. And, you know, it's he's basically indicative of Michigan. We said previewing the game, if you looked at the board, Alabama had the top talent in this game. But Michigan, it would go back to what we when we talked to Bruce Feldman. Michigan is just so well coached. They play great team football. Everybody steps up. You know, they, they don't have superior talent but they all do their part. And I think Blake Corum is indicative of that. And I think, you know, he's probably a guy who's going to go in the third round. He may not be a feature runner, but I think in the right role, he's going to be very productive as both a ball carrier, a pass catcher, and even a blocker, you know, on third down situations when you leave him in the backfield. I would like to see Donovan Edwards go back to school, Tony, yeah. to see him as the feature back. You know, I think his stock went down from last year to this year. He just wasn't as explosive and then I'd like to see Roman Wilson, if he gets the invite, go to the Senior Bowl to, you know, see what he does in a less Michigan-y system, right, where they're not throwing the ball a ton. Shifty guy, Roman Wilson, a guy who, you know, made that catch. That that tip ball was the one that went to Roman Wilson's hands, so he's got the focus and concentration. He was the one that also had that bad penalty on the Blake Corm screen pass uh, because he blocked the uh, blocked the defender in the back. I mean, it was a blatant block in the back. Uh I, and I think what you're going to see with Roman Wilson is <clears throat> he's a good receiver, but teams are going to look at him. His real great value at the next level will also be as a return specialist. And that's something to keep an eye on if he plays at the senior bowl. And then for Michigan's defense, Tony, real quick, dominant up front uh, in the first half, Alabama just couldn't even drop back to throw with yeah. the type of pressure they were getting. Uh, I did not think it was a great game for JC Latham, the Alabama right tackle, even on that final run play, Tony, where they're trying to run it in from the three-yard line in overtime, he gets pushed back into the backfield. And that's one of the reasons that run got disrupted. But Michael Barrett a sack, Josiah Stewart a sack, two sacks for Braden McGregor, Chris Jenkins, Derek Moore with a sack apiece. So that Michigan front really took it to that Alabama offensive line throughout this game. And, and their second tier, I mean, Junior Colson, the linebacker, was phenomenal yeah. yesterday. And Junior Colson's a guy who, coming into the season, I had him graded as a potential second-round pick. I moved him in the third round. I talked with someone. They said, you know, the production wasn't there. That is a concern. I'm told Junior Colson, I, I reported this previously, is going to enter the draft. The fact that he didn't have good production uh, during the regular season is going to be a question that scouts talk to him about during interviews. But the production was there last night. I mean, he was all over the field making plays behind the line of scrimmage, making plays against the run. Really, you saw the best of Junior Colson, who was a terrific linebacker yesterday. And as, I, as I've reported, I am told he's going to enter the draft. Rod Moore, the safety, also made some big-time plays. He's a big guy. Uh, <clears throat> he's got decent range. He's a guy who's also considering the draft. Let's say he's about 50-50 right now from what I hear. And then Alabama's offense, Tony, you know, it's not a whole lot. I mean, they ran for 172 yards, but it took 43 carries to do it. That's only four yards per carry. I thought your guy Jason McClellan had a nice game, 14 yeah. carries, 87 yards. You know, we saw Jalen Milrow. Again, the pressure had a lot to do with it, but just 116 yards passing. Um, any of this besides McClellan, and please talk about him, anyone else uh, from the Alabama offense jump out at you? Well, they didn't have too much offense, so the answer is no. I was surprised that they didn't, you know, when Milrow was getting pounded, they didn't try and just run the ball more with McClellan because every time McClellan touched the ball, he had a positive uh, run. Even when it was bottled up on the inside, he would gain three or four yards. And, you know, he did – I, I looked at the stats. I think it was midway through the third quarter or maybe halftime, and he only had nine carries. But he, had, he was averaging uh, close to eight yards, seven yards a carry. And I was surprised that he did not – they did not go more to the running game 
and have Michigan's focus go towards McClellan. Here's the thing about McClellan. I, I think he's going to be drafted after Blake Horm. He's probably going to be a early day three pick. Maybe he's a third round pick, but I think in the right system, he's going to be a terrific player at the next level. You know, he just knows how to pick up yards. He's got great vision. He's got great football instincts. He's a productive ball carrier. He's He's got an NFL build. Uh, and he was really the only bright spot in an Alabama offense that seemingly couldn't do anything like yesterday. We haven't talked a, a bunch about Alabama's two wide receivers, Tony, Isaiah Bond and Jermaine Burton. This is the second year now where Alabama, after a streak of like, what, four straight years where they had a first-round wide receiver, we're, we're not going to see one again. Uh, your thoughts on those two guys, Isaiah Bond and Jermaine Burton. Burton got hurt. Burton is a uh, is a guy who has shown big playability in the past. Uh He's a junior. I, I'd be surprised, especially if he, he got a little bit, uh, he, had a, uh, he got cramped up yesterday, had to take him off the field. He's been spotty, but Jalen Milrow has been developing too. And as we talked about, you know, with Malik Neighbors, Malik Neighbors' success was tied in with Jaden Daniels. I think it's much the same with Jermaine Burton. Isaiah Bond has come on, true sophomore. He's not draft eligible. He's made some big plays. He's got an upside. We'll have to see if he can capitalize on the good things he showed. <coughs> Excuse me. I did think that uh, getting back to Alabama, yeah, I thought their corners played relatively well yesterday. I thought both Terry and Arnold and uh, Kool-Aid McKistry both played well. Malachi Moore uh, had his struggles. I really didn't see Dallas Turner too much last night. He uh, had you know, one sack. Uh, Chris Braswell, he was he, he here and there, but I thought both of their uh, both of their corners – as much in run defense as well as coverage played very well last night. Yeah, Turner Turner had the one sack. I feel like I did see him in the back for a little bit, but I thought Braswell was 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 very quiet. He just had one tackle uh, on the game. And uh, you still think he's 50-50, Tony, whether or not he comes out? I I think after last night, it's it's pro. I, I was told that he was leaning towards going back, and then he was maybe thinking of entering. I, I'd be surprised if you know. I I shouldn't say I'd be surprised. I, I'm told it's still 50-50. Some people think he's going to leave. Some people think he's going to enter. I, like I said, just to go back to what I, I repeat what I said last week, I told he had a conversation with Saban. Saban told him, right now, you're a third round, maybe second round pick. If you go back and capitalize on this season and you do it, you know, you basically blow it out next year, you'll be a first round pick in 2025. And <clears throat> Saban's honest with his players. You know, yeah. if they're early first round picks, McKistry, uh, Arnold, you, you got to go. If you're going to be a first round pick, I'm told that he's uh, Braswell is basically thinking a lot about what uh, Coach Saban told him. Yeah, I'm sorry for doing a little U-turn here, but we did not mention uh, the two Texas defensive players I wanted to mention. Uh, Tavondre Sweat, there, the, he won the I think the, the 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 top defensive lineman in the Big Twelve this year, right? And then you know he was fine; he had three tackles in the game. But their other defensive tackle, who also I yeah. believe had a touchdown running the football, right, as the yeah. fullback in that game, Byron Murphy. He is explosive, Tony. Yep. He gets in the backfield. He's a good athlete. Every time I see that guy, I like him more and more. I'm gonna, I'm gonna correct you. What you said there. You said he's a good athlete. He is a great athlete. I've been told for the longest time when he goes to the combine, he's gonna be about 295 pounds. He's probably gonna run under four eight. Could run Ooh. in the low four sevens. And you see that athleticism on the film. Yeah, Tony, you that's the that thing. When you, honestly, I, I'm sorry for interrupting. I didn't realize he was 295. He plays like he's 280. Uh, well, he's, he's going to be 295 at the combine. Uh, so he's probably, you, you, he could be about 290 pounds now. But you see, you know, you see that athleticism on the film. The stats weren't great last night, but he was a disruptive force. He's quick off the snap. He's got a great closing burst. They were, you know, they were focusing on him. Sweat is more the guy, you know, that the next level is more of the gap occupier. Murphy's the playmaker. He's a phenomenal athlete. He's got tremendous upside. In my last mock draft at sportsgator.com, I had him as a first-round pick. I think as we get closer to the draft, you're going to hear more first-round buzz on Byron Murphy. I would be absolutely fine picking him in the second half of the first round. He looks like a really good player to me. I, I Yeah, especially against a good line. And it's not like Washington doesn't have a really good offensive line, right? And he was the one guy that I thought was disruptive for that Texas defense. All right, let's yeah, jump over. I'm sorry, Tony, you're going to add something? Yeah, their, their tackles were phenomenal. I, I think uh, Texas was able to exploit them a little bit in the middle of the line. Yeah. Uh, but I wholeheartedly agree with you about Murphy. All right, let, uh, let's let jump over to that Oregon game against Liberty. You mentioned and Bo Nix, phenomenal again, 28-35, 363 yards, five touchdowns. Bucky Irving, 14 for 117. And then 
Their other wide receiver, Tez Johnson, with a monster game, 11 catches for 172 yards and a touchdown. I don't know that you could take too much out of that game. I, I mean, Liberty was just so overmatched. I mean, Oregon was so overwhelming in that game. And, and you could see it early on. Liberty could never get back into that game. And uh, it, Johnson right now, I, he's, I have a fifth-round grade on him coming into the season. He's a guy, he's a fourth-year senior, but scouts basically ignored him. Good for him for stepping up next year. We'll, we'll see if he enters the draft. There's a couple of those guys I think I had mentioned Jordan Birch, the defensive end from Oregon, who's not declared yet. They're offering him, like I was told, the million-dollar NIL deal to come back. And, and by the uh, way, Birch did play in that game, too. So he Well, did the play. only guys who didn't play in the game were Troy Franklin and Powers Johnson, I think, mm -hmm. were the only two Oregon guys, or main Oregon guys, that opted out of that game. Uh, but, but again, I, I mean, I don't know that you can take much out of that game except for the fact that maybe Liberty probably shouldn't have been in that game. <laughs> um, because they were just so overmatched by uh, by Oregon. Yeah, sometimes the 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 level of the athlete, right, is just so different. It doesn't matter how good of a how well coached you are, how how you know well you execute. Uh, just the better athletes are going to come out on tap. All right, you have a couple other um, games you wanted to get into, Tony. Uh, Peach Bowl, Hayden Priestcorn from Ole Miss, monster game, ten catches, hundred thirty six yards, and two touchdowns. That's a name we have not mentioned so far on this. Uh, years worth of episodes on draft season. And he is a guy who he came into the season. I'm looking at it now. He got, he was, he's, he transferred from Memphis, came into the season, was given third round grades by scouts, kind of had an up and down year, just blew it open against uh, in the peach bowl, had a great game. Here's, here's something that I was told. I was told that both Hayden Prescorn and their receiver that everybody loves, Trey Harris, very likely to go back to school next year. They're both uh, seniors. They were both graded by scouts coming into the year. Uh, uh, Trey Harris got a six-round grade. Free scoring got a third-round grade. I'm told that they're li very likely, or the word is, they're going to go back to school with Jackson Dart. And you're going to be looking at Mississippi Ole Miss next year as one of the front runners for the SEC West. I thought they'd be a front runner this year. They, ha they hit a bump in the road early on. They couldn't beat Alabama. But most of that uh, Mississippi team's going back. Getting back to pre-scoring, 6'5 and a half, 262 pounds. He's your Michael Mayer type, if you will. You know, he's not the downfield threat on a consistent basis, but he's just a well-rounded, complete tight end who can block, who catches the ball well in the short and intermediate field, who, who plays smart football, who is your more conventional type of tight end if you don't have an offense where you want the tight end, you know, running 30 yards down the field. All right, and then a guy we have mentioned uh, in the Con Bowl, Cody Schrader, Tony, continues to impress 129 yards and a touchdown. And again, I don't think he's, again, maybe the, the tape isn't indicative. I, my guess is that he's not going to test particularly well, but he was a guy, and you made you made this point on an earlier show, you did not have him graded as a draftable player before this year. And now, you know, he he's going to be probably like a fourth or fifth round pick. Nobody did. I, I mean, not, none of the scouting sheets had him drafted. Truman State transfer, a great story. And the thing about him is, you know, you, you look at the, you just mentioned the stats. His blocking was outstanding too in that game. I mean, he's a guy who's well-rounded in all areas of the game. He is, he has accepted an invitation to the uh, senior ball. And again, we talked about Blake Corum. You know, we, we talked about Chase McClellan. Schrader's a guy who's probably going to be a late round pick. Sixth round. I don't think he gets in the fifth round. But it's just going to be find a nice role at the next level and be productive at it, and it's a great story. All right, let's go to Duke's Mayo Bowl. And a guy, <laughs> I, I love his name, Power Eccles with 11 <clears throat> tackles in the game, Tony. <clears throat> the uh, Gray, Cedric Gray, sat out, opted out of this game. Power Eccles, who's a little bit smaller than Cedric Gray, who's got a third-round grade. A little bit smaller, but he's more explosive. He's outstanding in pursuit. He's a better coverage uh linebacker more of your conventional four three weak side linebacker if you will go sideline to sideline not a big blitzer but a guy that it just jumps off the film on you in the sense that he's very athletic he can go sideline to sideline he can get from point a to point b to make the tackle very quickly I, I was told early on he was considering entering the draft i don't know if playing in the mayo bowl is a sign that he's going to return back to uh north carolina but if he enters the draft, I think he's a third-round pick. He is really a three-down linebacker 
And a guy that's great in space, you're just not going to ask him to blitz all that much. All right, let's go to the Gator Bowl. J.J. Yeah. Weaver impressed you. Five tackles, two tackles for losses, two sacks. Tell us about J.J. Weaver. We even talked about him on draft Weaver is, so far this year. Yeah, Weaver is the exact opposite. Weaver is your 3-4 outside, up-the-field type linebacker. 6'4 and a half, 245 pounds, runs and plays in the 4 7 but you stand him up over tackle. I think he had like eight sacks this year, seven and a half uh, tackles for loss. Those numbers may be reversed. Gets a lot of force up the field. I know that Jim Nagy early on was tweeting a lot about him, liked him a lot. He's kind of fallen off. I've not seen any invitation to the senior ball or to the shrine game. But again, if you're looking for a situational pass rusher, his draft stock will be directly related to how fast he runs. He's got to run the four, seven, five area. If he does, he's going to slide into day three and some three, four outside linebacker. Uh, some three, four outside team defensive team scheme is going to draft them in the late rounds and use them as a situational pass rusher. Uh, you mentioned the senior bowl, Tony, let's get to that. We have some more uh, invitations that were accepted. Uh, I guess all the guys that played for Georgia decided let's all do this at the same time. So two wide receivers, Lad McConkey and Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint, both saying they're going to the senior bowl and then defensive back Tyke Smith. Tell the folks about those three players. Yeah, McConkey, you know, he's everybody loves McConkey. I mean, he's smart, he's reliable, he's more of a possession wide out. He's a day two pick, doesn't have great size, 5'11, 180 pounds, doesn't have great speed. He's your Blake Horm at the receiver position, if you will. He's not going to wow anybody the way he looks, the way he tests, but he's just a ter- terrific football player and he's a return specialist. Uh, Rosemary Jack Saint was graded by some scouts as a seventh round pick coming into the year. He's very consistent. He's got good length. He catches the ball. Well, I think, you know, having him go to the senior bowl adds a little bit of hometown flavor. I don't think, uh, you know, if he gets drafted, he's going to, or if he runs fast, he's going to have to run fast to get drafted. And if he gets drafted, it's going to going to be uh, in the late rounds. And how about Tyke Smith, the defensive back? Tyke Smith, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to see he had the season he did. What happened was is two years ago, three years ago, he was playing at, he played at West Virginia. He was phenomenal. He looked like a first round choice. He transferred to Georgia, uh, had to uh, basically compete for the for a playing time there. He got injured. He, he injured his knee. He missed most of the 2021 struggling 2022. His game really took off this year. The guy's got great ball skills. The guy's got decent size. It's a matter of him. Is he completely healthy? Can he get back to where he was at West Virginia? If he does, he's going to be a steal in day three. He he played very well this year at Georgia. Basically, uh, some reminiscent of what of his days back at West Virginia. He's got some big time talent. Not the biggest guy in the world, but a real good football player. All right, we got two more. Cody Schrader, somebody we already talked about. Uh, then you have Ray Davis, the Kentucky running back, and then Georgia State John Trey Hunter. Tony, pick out who you want to talk about from that group. Talk about John Trey Hunter because probably nobody knows him because nobody watches Georgia State, right? <laughs> John Trey John Trey Hunter is a little bit of a smaller guy, but he's very athletic. I just did my Georgia State film literally this weekend. He's a guy who goes sideline to sideline. He's instinctive. He does a great job making the defensive calls. He gets some force up the field, but he goes sideline to sideline. A little bit smaller, struggles taking on blocks. I, I, I think Hunter, who was not even graded by scouts coming into the year, had a terrific year. I think he's a day three guy. He could be your nickel linebacker where when it's third and five uh, and they may run the ball, they may pass the ball. You put him on the field because he's a good, does a good job in coverage. Also does an excellent job in pursuit. Uh, Like you said, going to the senior ball. So what's going to happen is, you know, you want to watch him in those coverage drills. You also want to see him in those blocking drills. You know, when they have those, they they have the, the, the uh, running backs and the fullbacks uh, go up against the linebackers and they go all out in, in those blocking drills. Want to see how Hunter does. Is he able to hold his ground or is he getting flattened? I, I think right now he's going to struggle because he looks a little bit small. He's not as strong, but he's a very good athlete and he's got excellent range. Absolutely. All right. We did get, oh, we got to talk about one more guy uh, declaring for the NFL draft, which I think was a little bit of a surprise, Tony, because I think he was in the transfer portal and people expected him to transfer, but instead Cam Ward will be in the NFL draft. Uh, give the fans an idea of what Cam Ward's all about for those that might not know him and, uh, what range are we looking at for him when he comes out? Yeah, I, I, it's not a surprise to me because when this whole transfer portal started, I said to you, and I even wrote on Sports Skeeter, what, was ha- what would happen is a lot of these guys would enter the transfer portal c- to kind of test the free agent market, to see what kind of NIL deals they got. And if they didn't get the NIL deal they wanted, 
they would enter the draft or maybe go back to their original school. We saw it last year with Grayson McCall. Entered the transfer portal, didn't get what he wanted, went back to uh, went back to Coastal Carolina, entered the transfer portal again uh, this year. Not a surprise with Cam Ward, uh, especially with the uh, situation with the Washington State football program. Cam Ward has already accepted an invitation to the Shrine Bowl, so I'll see him at the Shrine Bowl. Cam Ward is a big, athletic quarterback who's got a huge arm. He makes a lot of plays with his legs, but sometimes you don't know where the ball is going to go. I mean, his pass placement and his accuracy leads a lot to be developed. He's got all the physical tools. He's just got to improve his mechanics. He's got to improve his accuracy, if you will. I think he's a day three type of guy uh, who's got a lot of upside, but he needs a lot of work on his game from the ground up. All right. Uh, I do have questions from Twitter again. I put another tweet out there, got some good responses, but we're already 40 minutes into this, and I wanted to get to one more topic. So we'll either get to them next week or the following, guys. we still got four months of uh, draft coverage as you get ready for the NFL draft at the end of April. So make sure you hang with us here. All right, so we have one week left in the NFL season, Tony, and we have an idea of what the NFL draft order looks like, but still a lot to be decided this weekend. Um, One thing we do know is that the Chicago Bears, via the Carolina Panthers, will have the first overall pick in the draft. And, Tony, this is really why teams are hesitant trading first-round picks because they can turn into this. And you want to talk about the absolute worst-case scenario for the Carolina Panthers? That's what this is. Look. I'm not saying Bryce Young is not going to be a good player. We both liked him a lot last year. I think he's in a terrible situation there. But to trade that first-round pick to move up last year to get Bryce Young, and then you're picking first this year when two, maybe maybe three, better quarterback prospects are available in this year's draft, man, that is a rough go if you're a Panther fan right there. Not only that is the quarterback that was selected right after Bryce Young is, you know, is setting all kinds of rookie records and his team is in it in in week uh, in the last week of the season for a potential playoff spot. So, you know, it's just horrible optics, horrible optics. And, you know, you're not going to be able to get the left tackle at the top of the draft to protect Bryce Young. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, or or, or Marvin Harrison Jr. Take your pick. uh, and the thing is, is you know, I, I didn't think that there would be a huge market last year to move up to that top pick, uh, you know, to get Bryce Young. Obviously, I was wrong, but obviously it shows, you know, how quarterbacks are so overdrafted. And I agree with you. You know, can't throw the towel in on Bryce Young, but there's a lot of things there that are very alarming. Uh, we'll have to see how it plays out. And Chicago looks like geniuses now. I mean, they have two first-round picks. They're going to be selecting at the top of the draft. Probably going to take Caleb Williams. I mean, Justin Fields. Uh, I don't know that you can move. I don't know that you can move forward with him when you have the opportunity to draft a yeah, Caleb Williams. And he's Although, playing well, Tony. It's not his fault. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, he's playing okay. I, I mean, he looks more like a, a a better runner who passes on occasion. He's. I, I I just don't know that you can stick with Justin Fields when you have the ability to draft Caleb Williams. Although there's no guarantees on Caleb Williams, but he looks very, you know, he looks like a dynamic uh, a quarterback for the next level and, and, and good for the, uh, the bears. And then after that, it's anybody's guess. I mean, yeah. Washington could have the second pick of the draft. The Patriots play the jets have the second pick of the draft could have the second pick of the draft. Arizona's there four and 12 after their, you know, upset a uh, victory over Philadelphia. You know, we were talking, it's funny because we were talking, you know, the Giant fans had to be happy. They played a great game against the Rams. It came down to the final field goal. Their th- what? Their third kicker missed the field goal. Okay, they lost the game, but they kept draft positioning. Where Arizona pulled it out against the Philadelphia Eagles, and you got to wonder what the Arizona fans are thinking. You never play to lose. I, I mean, you can't keep playing for draft positioning because it never works out. You want your team to win, but I understand what the fans are thinking. The the, the Arizona fans are probably thinking, man, I really wish we would have lost that game by three points rather than winning because we would have had the second pick of the draft and show ourselves to Marvin Harrison or one of the offensive tackles if we want to go in that direction. Yeah, right now they're sitting at four. Those three teams are four and 12, Tony, to your point. Washington plays Dallas this week, and Dallas needs that game for the NFC East. So, I mean, look, weird things have happened. We saw Arizona beat Philly last week, but that would be the upset of the century if Washington beats Dallas this week, right? Uh, New England, they have the Jets. Right. <laughs> Who knows? Right. When those two teams play each other. And then Arizona has to play Seattle and Seattle's playing for a potential playoff spot in the NFC. So uh, those three teams, uh, you know, will be battling it out. And then there are three teams at five and 11 
with yeah. the Giants. You know, they're taking on the Eagles this week at home. The way the Eagles are playing, I mean, I think anyone could be Philadelphia at this point, and, right? And, and the and Giants were in that game two weeks ago. I mean, it Absolutely. wasn't it, it, you know they were in they could have won that game two weeks ago. Chargers are playing the Chiefs. And the Chiefs, obviously, a playoff team. And then Tennessee, we got to see if Will Levis, I'm, I didn't get an update on his injury yet. He had to leave that game last week. They have Jacksonville, and Jacksonville is playing for a playoff spot. So uh, then you have one team at 6-10 and 10 in the Jets. So that 1-8, through eight, I think, is really going to be interesting. And, these, and you know, obviously the tiebreaker is strength of schedule against. Uh, right now the Giants sit at the 5-hole, Chargers 6, Titans 7. Uh, Jets at 8 at 6-10. and 10. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in a lot of these games. And then as we get the exact draft order after next week, we'll start doing mock drafts. We'll talk about team needs and all that stuff. But as we try to figure out where, you know, I think it's fairly universal who the blue chip players are in this draft class and try to figure out where they're going to go and the quarterback specifically, you know, the order here is going to be really key because if a team that needs a quarterback, Tony, finishes out of that top four, five, or six, it, they're going to have to move up to get a quarterback. And as we just spoke about with the Panthers last year, that's when things can get very expensive very quickly. Well, forget about the what, what, trade for Carson Wentz, trade to get Carson Wentz, Jared Goff, Robert Griffin. These trades, for the most part, where these teams are giving away tons of draft capital, future draft capital. Please, how about Sam Darnold and Zach Wilson with the Jets, right? They did it twice. You know, uh, Trey Lance. Zach Wilson was the second pick. It was Trey Lance that San Francisco moved up to oh, and gave away right. a bunch of first round picks. Those trades don't usually, usually don't work out for the team in favor of the team that's training up to get the player. You know, it's funny. You, you talk about the strength of schedule. I'm looking here. The Jets are uh, six and ten. If they beat the Patriots and they, and all those other teams finish uh, seven and ten, as the Jets would, the Jets would go from like the eighth pick of the draft potentially to the 12th pick of the yeah, draft. Yeah. So, uh, y you know, what do you do if you're a Jets fan? I mean, the Jets players don't want to lose. You know, Salah wants to win because uh, he's on the hot seat. Uh, but the fans are like, yeah, you know, you, let, let, hopefully we lose and we get that eighth pick. But again, you can't, you, you know, if you end up playing for draft positioning every year as the Jets do, you end up where the Jets are. Absolutely. And you go back. I mean, that one, I forget. I'm sure you remember what team it was against. They won that game late in the year and they ended up picking up second instead of first. And they missed that on Trevor Lawrence. So, um, like you said, you can't play to lose, but sometimes unfortunate things happen as a result of winning those games at it. And, and it does hurt teams long-term Tony happy new year, my friend enjoy uh, the college football playoffs next week. We'll be back with you guys next Tuesday. Once again, look forward to it, John. And then we'll know these, we'll know the first, Draft order for, I guess, what, the first 18 picks in the draft. We'll talk about that. We'll review the college football national championship, and then we'll get to some of those Twitter questions as well. Thanks for being with us on draft season. We'll see you next time, everybody.